and then we'll see the pace. And, and also, I don't want to make it completely like a lecture. Okay, so you can interrupt me any time. Any questions you have, you know, you want to discuss, you know, pertaining to that particular topic or in general anything. So we can just continue our discussion also in between. Okay, so these are the, okay, this is my affiliation. And I put some images uh, just to give you, so you know, what we'll be learning. We won't be doing a lot of turbulent combustion. I believe there was a course here. Uh, earlier this year by Professor uh, Dr. Point So. So he's uh, one of the authorities in turbulent combustion modeling. So I hope uh, especially IIT students were able to attend that course. So anyway, what you see on the left here, some images of flame. So this is a, you know, so we learn different types of flames, you know, during the course like premix flames, non premix flames, partially premix flames. So here your image of, image of a non premixed or diffusion flame. So this is flame coming, you know, the fuel is coming out through a tube, so it's a jet flame. And that's like a typical jet flame, you know, image. Uh, now if you reduce the gravity, so it's almost like zero gravity, so same flame becomes nearly spherical. So what it indicates is that the diffusion flame are governed by the transport phenomena. Okay, so there's, you know, there's chemical kinetics, transport, transport means there's convection, there's diffusion. Okay. So the convection here is strongly influencing the shape of the flame. Okay. So it goes from like a cylindrical, you know, conical to spherical because of the loss of gravity, okay, or the presence of gravity. Other image, that's a typical Bunsen burner flame. So I think in the chemistry course or other courses you would have seen this Bunsen burner flame. So again, the mixture is coming out from a tube. The main difference is in the diffusion flame, you have the pure fuel coming out from the tube. So from the nozzle, you have a pure fuel coming out. Okay. So the, comb the flame, when you say flame, then it means high temperature, there's a high reaction, high rea you know, reaction rates are very high. So the, the flame or the reaction zone okay, separates the, you know, the fuel and the oxidizer in a diffusion flame. So the fuel and oxidizer, they are not mixed before they arrive at the flame. So that's a called non premix flame. That's probably a better, you know, nomenclature for diffusion flame. Okay. In the premix flame, fuel and oxidizer, okay, they are mixed before they arrive at the flame. They are already premixed. So the reaction zone in this case, so you can see the thin reaction zone. It separates the fuel air mixture, okay, and then you have the products on both sides of the flame. Mainly they are on the other side of the flame. So you can say that the flame or the reaction zone separates the fuel air mixture and the products. Okay. And during the course we'll study the very detailed structure of these flames. So as you'll see, we'll build up first the fundamentals. Okay. So fundamentals means you know chemical equilibrium, what is the adiabatic flame temperature, what is the equilibrium composition. And then we'll study other parts, like chemical kinetics, okay, how do you represent reaction rates, okay. Then the transport phenomena, convection, diffusion, and then what are the governing equations. Okay. So those are the fundamentals, then we, after that, then we'll study actual flames. Okay. Then we go into this reaction zones, what's going on, you know, where is high temperature, where is the, where are the emissions produced, you know, things like that. So the broad outline of the topics covered are on the next slide. I think you have copies of this slide, correct? You have all the copies of these slides? Yeah, so when you look at those, there are, oh, I think also on the next slide. So these are the, just the outline of the main topics to be covered. Of course, you know, we'll cover maybe part of each topic, maybe not, you know, not all the details. And then I've given you the introduction, the reference materials, 
there are you know, three, four books I have mentioned. When I teach, I use the Turns book okay, quite a lot. Then I take material from Foreman Williams book, CK Law book. Then there are some older books, uh, the Spalding, there are a couple of others, the Glassman. And now there are a lot of conference and journal papers. Okay. When I was a student, okay, it was very difficult to get journal papers. You had to go to the library, find a paper, then you had to pay you and make the Xerox copy. These days all you do is you know, flick, click one button and you have the paper. Not only that paper, it tells you, you know, what are the other related papers. So you get lots of information just online these days. If you say laminar premix flame, just type that and you can get tremendous information. You can probably get a lot of lectures also online. Okay. So a lot of information has been disseminated online and it's all available these days, you know, almost free. <coughs> so the next slide, so these are okay, the topics and there are the sessions which are, you know, following the dateline like from today. Okay. So sessions, and then there's a lecture one. So lecture one, two, three, four, and so on, they pertain to those, you know, material, you know, which was copied, I think, you know, in the. So I sent the PDF of lecture one, lecture two, and then you can see how the connection is made to the sessions. Okay, for example, today I think there are four sessions. Okay, so I'll do the first two sessions, then Professor, you know, Dr. Kushari will do the next two, and then we'll continue. So you can see the main topics here we'll cover. As I mentioned, you know, thermochemistry, that's the first main topic. So thermochemistry means you use the classical thermodynamics, okay, to, to understand, you know, how you predict the equilibrium temper, you know, properties. So if you have a reacting mixture at equilibrium, okay, what are the main properties? The temperature, composition. So how do you predict, calculate the temperature, and the composition of that mixture. Okay. So using an example, let's say if you have hydrogen and oxygen in a volume, in a container. Okay. So what is the equilibrium, you know, temperature of that mixture? So that we call as the adiabatic flame temperature. Okay. And that temperature is directly related to the actual flame temperatures you see in you know, real combustors. Then what will be the composition? because initially you had hydrogen and oxygen. So at equilibri equilibrium, but that mixture is not at equilibrium. Okay. So we'll use the laws of you know, the first and the second law of thermodynamics okay, to compute the equilibrium properties, like the flame temperature and the composition. So composition here will mean in this example, so you'll have mostly water, right, H2O. Okay. And then there may be some other species. There may be a little bit of oxygen depending on the mixture conditions. Okay. Then there will be some other species like OH, H. So we'll compute the detailed properties of that mixture at equilibrium. Okay. <clears throat> and then, you know, chemical reactions, that is, you know, sessions seven and nine, those numbers probably will change, you know, as we go along, okay, depending on the pace. So then there are chemical kinetics, so how do you write the reaction rate for individual reactions? And then the reaction mechanism. So that's the third bullet here, lecture three. So reaction mechanism there will take some examples, okay, that how do you write that, you know, all the reactions going from the fuel and oxygen, okay, to products. The main products are again, you know, H2O, CO2, and some other species. And then the next two bullets, okay, so those are the fundamental governing equations. Okay. So after that, we'll study actual flames, so premix flames, and then diffusion flames, so which is sessions 27 and 30. That is just for reference. And then, okay, main pollutants formation. 
So, what are the reaction rates involved? What are the main reactions okay, forming those pollutants? Okay. Like NOx, you know, particulates, okay, and maybe some other pollutants. Droplet vaporization and combustion, okay, that topic will be covered by Professor Kushari okay, during the later part of this course. Okay, so so first thing you know why the need to study combustion or use combustion. So usually start with this. Okay, this is a couple of years old uh, picture. So this plots okay the fuel consumption or the fuel energy release from the fuel com uh, fuel uh, consumption. Okay, so it gives a historic perspective for the say 1990 all the way to 2040. So we are like now 2015, 2020. So what you see in the main thing here you see is that most of the energy is coming from fossil fuels. Okay, so here you have 34%. If you draw the same way here, about 34% from liquid fuels. Then 28 percent from coal. Okay, this distribution of course varies from country to country, and then 22 percent from natural gas. Okay, so that's about 75, 80 percent of the energy is coming from the fossil uh, sources. Okay. Then of course you have about 20, 25 percent from renewable, nuclear, <coughs> hydro, solar. You know all the, all of them included. And if you project this to the next 25 years. So the picture doesn't change very significantly. Okay. That, that doesn't mean it won't change. You know, it's possible that it will change. You know, the technology is moving so fast. Okay. So I can, you know, we can vision maybe there, there will be a way to charge your electric car as you're driving. Okay. So if some technological leap comes along, this picture can change. But in general, we can expect that the combustion will be a major part of you know energy per, per production. Okay. So again combustion means you know the various applications which are on this previous slide. Okay. So combustion deals with the conversion of chemical energy, like the hydrogen stores chemical energy, okay, to thermal energy. So when you have combustion, hydrogen, oxygen, so you produce the thermal energy. Of course, there are various sources of uh, fuels, gaseous, liquid, and solid fuels. And then the thermal energy is used in different ways, you know, whether for transportation. Okay. So in transportation, like you know, aircraft engine, it is used as the kinetic energy. If it is the automobile engine, it is used as the mechanical energy. So different ways of using that thermal energy. So obviously, then combustion is important for, you know, transportation industry, power generation process. Okay, then we use combustion, you know, the gas furnaces for heating. You know, most like in U.S., most of the house heating, thus they have central heating. So where there is a furnace. Oh, thank you. This one is working better. Oh, this is much better. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> so, like in the U.S., I was saying the most of the home heating, they are gas furnaces, so use natural gas. Okay. And if you open that door, I have done that many times. You can see the flame. Okay. So those flames, you know, there's a, like a, you know, like a row of flames. These are all diffusion flames. So we'll study the, those later. Then combustion is also, of course, important for fire safety. Okay, fire safety as so that means you know avoidance of fire as well as suppression of fire. Okay, and some newer topics like material synthesis. Okay, some nanomaterials can be made, you know, using the synthesis, you know, in flames. Okay, and of course, you know, it is very important to study for reducing the pollutants. Of related to the greenhouse gases. Okay. 
and the newer applications which have come along last 10, 15 years, okay, to produce synthetic fuels. Okay. So that involves in different ways, you know, combustion, okay, or chemical reactions. So it continues to offer many challenges and opportunities. Okay, it remains an area of active research. No, we, sorry. Yeah, anytime. Yeah. Uh, sir, do they use heat pumps for uh, space heat pump? Heat pump, I In theory, we study heat pumps are superior to uh, combustion. But yeah, I have not studied in detail like what percentage of, you know, homes. Oh. Okay. Uh, it's possible some commercial buildings are using heat pumps. Okay. The funding agency in U.S., you know, that's the Department of Energy. That's one of the funding agencies. So they, they sponsor projects on heat pumps, okay, and also on uh, what you call, you know, the hybrid systems. You have a heat pump, okay, <coughs> so you can also get energy from solar and then, okay, have into a heat pump. So there are different, yeah, there are some, you know, but I don't know exactly like what percentage is used. Okay, yeah. So what drives the combustion studies or combustion research? Okay, so fun, one thing is 80% of the energy coming from combustion, and then climate change and other pollutants. So the, <coughs> the standards and the regulations are becoming increasingly stringent. Okay, so that is driving a major part of combustion research these days. So in U.S., in Europe, and increasingly in you know developing country China, India, there are you know new regulations. And manufacturers are having difficulty you know meeting those regulations. Okay, so whatever is the level of regulation, there are difficulties. Okay, so so regulation, greenhouse gases. So that means you know you need to improve the efficiencies, which we call the low-hanging fruit. Okay. So because if you improve the efficiency, that also affects the greenhouse gases. Okay. So gr improving efficiency, reducing emissions, and developing renewable fuel. So those are the three okay, motivations for you know, doing combustion, okay, combustion research. Okay, next few slides. Okay, I'll give you a quick, okay, Summary of you know the various fuels. Okay, so we won't be using a lot of these fuels, lot, you know, many of these fuels, but some of them we'll be using you know during the course. Okay. So it's kind of a primer for fuels, so it will be very quick. So various types of fuels. So you can start with one category: solid, liquid, and gaseous fuels. Okay. So solid fuels like coal is the best example. Okay. So. Then there are metal combustions. There are metals which are used in, in, in a propulsion. Okay. It could be aluminum or some other metals. Okay. <coughs> and then petroleum-derived fuels. So here we are talking of mostly liquid and gaseous fuels. <coughs> so now these fuels are typically like gasoline or diesel fuel. They contain you know, hundreds of different compounds. So that's one challenging part of you know combustion modeling and study of combustion because the real fuels contain you know many you know different compounds. So I'll give you a brief primer on this gasoline. What is the composition? Diesel, aviation fuel. Then other types of fuel: the agriculture and biomass-based fuels. Okay. So these are part of the renewable fuels. So here you have alcohols. Okay, alcohols like ethanol, butanol, then biodiesels, then synthetic gas, hydrogen, then there are also these fissure trough fuels. So using the syngas, you can produce liquid fuels, okay, using this process called fissure trough, so these are called fissure trough fuels. Okay. Synthetic fuels I already mentioned, like you know, syngas, biogas, and so on. Okay. Now, most of these liquid or natural uh, gaseous fuels, they contain different kinds of hydrocarbons. 
So I'll go over a couple of, <coughs> couple of slides talking about different types of hydrocarbons, you know, which comprise the fuel. <coughs> okay, gasoline. Okay. So <coughs> gasoline, now most of these fuels are coming from the crude oil, okay? So here give an example. A lot of this information you can find, you know, just online. If you go to Google or some other search engine and type some keywords, you can find all this information. Okay. So gasoline, for example, one barrel, you know, in international market, they use barrel prices, which is like about 159 liters. So it yields about 72 liters of gasoline. Okay. So it contains a mixture of, it has a, it's a mixture of many hydrocarbons, okay, uh, mostly aliphatic. So next slide, it was discussing you know, what is al aliphatic. So basically how many carbons and then how many hydrogen atoms. So aliphatic means you have a mixture of alkanes, cycloalkanes, okay, olefins. So I have a later slide, you know, talking about these different, you know, alkanes and so on. So typical mixture has, okay, this much percentage of isoalkanes like isooctane, okay. For natural gas contains a lot of, you know, isooctane. This octane number comes from that, okay, because, you know, how much, okay, typically it contains isooctane. Then uh, small, relatively smaller <coughs> amount of alkanes, okay. So alkanes will be like heptane, <coughs> decane, dodecane, and so on. Okay. So those are straight chain hydrocarbons. Then there are branch chain hydrocarbons like cycloalkanes or cycloalkenes. And there are aromatics. Okay. So typically then, okay, you have iso and alkanes, straight chain cycloalkanes, and aromatics. Aromatics, for example, you know, benzene. Those have, you know, compounds with ring structure. So I'll show you in a minute. Okay. Now, when you model, when you study these flames using this gasoline, okay, so it's very difficult to just use gasoline, create a flame and make measurements because gasoline contains so many different compounds. Then we try to use a fuel which is a good representative for gasoline. So those we call surrogates. So over the years, people have used like, okay, for gasoline, isooctane. Okay. So if it is all isooctane, okay, it will be the octane number will be 100. Okay. So then it should be a mixture of isooctane and something else. Okay. So a more realistic surrogate is a mixture of heptane, isooctane. Okay. So heptane is an example of alkane, straight chain. And isooctane, okay, is a branch chain, and then toluene represents the aromatics. So the three main representative sources, okay, compounds. And the main property is the anti-knocking, okay, which is defined by the octane rating. And then there are other properties. So I will, can, you know, skip this part. Okay, so gasoline, the other main fuel is the diesel fuel. So there are typically three grades of diesel fuel. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So those are the those are the volatile organic compounds. Okay. So yeah, I did not mention about the emissions. Okay. So Okay. So the regulation will be in terms of, you know, for the gasoline engine, NOx, okay, VOC, and yeah, the VOC is a volatile organic compound. Okay, so diesel fuel, 
Then I have listed the, the important properties which are as specified by this uh, standard you know, agency. So these, these are, I don't remember the exact acronym, but you can easily find that online. Yes, uh, sorry? Yeah, yeah, just on the spot, I don't remember, but it's very easy to find. Okay. And I don't try to remember, the, <laughs> frankly. Okay. So the, main, so the most important property for diesel is the C10 number. Okay. So you can tell me, like, what is the C10 number of the fuel, diesel fuel used uh, in India? Around 50. So, so I think Europe and uh, India, I don't know about China, they use a higher C10 diesel, okay? 50, 55, I think Europe probably 55. In US it is like 40, 45, okay? So that may have to do with the core start or some other things they need to satisfy, <coughs> okay? And then other properties, depending on, you know, the region or the country, okay? <coughs> Then, of course, there are severe regulation in terms of emissions, particularly, you know, especially the particulates and NOx. And most of the diesel manufacturers are, you know, working very hard to meet those regulations. Okay. The composition, okay, so about 75% alkane, so those are like three, you know, the normal ISO, which are the branch and the cyclo and about 25% aromatics, okay? So aromatics are the one which produce, so to are the particulates, okay? Sources for the particulates. And the average formula, okay? Now, most of the earlier research, they were using, you know, normal heptane as the surrogate for diesel fuel, okay? More recent work, they are using a mixture like normal iso and cycloalkanes, Okay. And maybe one, sometimes, you know, two aromatic compounds, like toluene, okay, they use. And there are other aromatic compounds. So these are the two main properties. I made a separate slide for <coughs> cetane rating and octane rating. Okay. So it gives the definition of what is octane rating and what is cetane rating. Okay. So, so I will not go through in detail. You can read this, okay. So basically, it's a mixture of, you can say, isooctane and heptane. So if it is 10% hep heptane, 90% octane, then octane rating is 90. For high performance cars, you know, octane rating can be more than 100 even. So this is the octane rating is basically the ability to resist, you know, so this re reflects the anti-knocking properties. So what is knocking? Knocking is a uncontrolled combustion, okay? So undesired or uncontrolled combustion. So you don't want the engine to be knocking. Okay. So it can auto-ignite somewhere instead of, you know, spark ignition in a gasoline engine. Okay. When it does, you know, it it produces a lot of undesirable effects. The most severe will be, you know, it can damage, okay, damage the engine. Because otherwise you hear tremendous amount of noise, a lot of pressure fluctuations, okay. So, and this, this is also a proper, this auto ignition in gasoline engine is a property of the compression ratio. Okay. So to avoid knocking, you have to keep the compression ratio lower. So if you keep the compression ratio lower, that means, you know, you cannot generate, you know, as much power as you, you can do in a diesel engine. And also the efficiency goes down when you have the lower compression ratio. So there are always, you know, pro and cons when you design. Okay. And then the, what is the C10 number? <coughs> so C10 number is determined by having a mixture of C10, which is hexadecane, and iso C10. Okay. which will give you the same ignition delay. So ignition delay is measured in a very controlled environment, and there is a standard value for the ignition delay in terms of the time, 2.4 millisecond. So they take a mixture, okay, different mixtures which will produce the same amount of ignition delay, 
So that's how you determine the seat end rate. So two more types: the aviation fuels. So gasoline, diesel, and then aviation. So in aviation fuel, jet A fuel is the most commonly used in U.S. There, jet A one. Okay. So it's so only you know some constituents or some properties are different. Otherwise, they are very you know similar fuels. So typically, they contain six to sixteen. Okay, carbons. Okay. Again, the major components include branched and straight chain alkanes and cycloalkanes and aromatics. Okay, and small amount of you know olefins, which are alkenes. Then, for military applications, they have the JP8, which is similar to A1, but with some other you know proper uh, additives and properties are different. So, biofuels. So in U.S., typical the gasoline fuel is up to 10 percent of ethanol, okay. and of course the whole idea is to reduce emissions. But there are always some other political considerations, you know, to use ethanol, maybe to promote, you know, the agriculture industry, things like that. Okay. Now there's a lot of interest going to higher alcohols like butanol, pentanol and even higher al alcohols because they have more you know diesel type of properties than say methanol or ethanol biodiesels produced from different sources using this transesterification process or some other process and then synthetic fuels so this is basically repetition what i already mentioned so I'll skip this again. It gives you okay, a quick re overview of you know the not only re renewable diesel but other fuels also. Okay. So now I was talking about all these alkanes, alkenes, cycloalkanes. So this is a quick primer on the various hydrocarbons. So we start with the simplest one. Okay. So basically, okay. To fully saturate the structure, so one carbon, okay, needs four hydrogen, okay. or it needs you know another carbon and then three hydrogen, okay. So it depends. So it, you have to fill make like four bonds. It could be four single bonds, or you can have two double bonds, okay, or you can have two double bond and two single bonds, okay. So that is the main idea when you draw these structures, okay, chemical structure of the fuel. Okay. So for example, carbon um, methane, which is the simplest, it needs four hydrogen. So if you go to ethane, so I can show this on the board. So you have one carbon, then of course you have four hydrogen. Now if you have two carbon, So your CH4, if you add another carbon, you just add CH2. Okay. So this will become C2H6. So this is C2, <coughs> right? So you want to go to C3. So these are straight chain saturated hydrocarbons. Okay. So I can just draw like this for C3. So just showing the position of the carbon atom. Okay. And then you can add hydrogen knowing that this is you know propane. Okay. But just looking at this, okay, so people know that okay, this is propane. Okay. Or you can add the hydrogen. So this is what is shown here. Ethane, butane, four. So butane will be so one, two, three, we add one more. So that way you can write the, the, the chemical structure. Then the last one is heptane, normal heptane. And then these are some example of el, you know, alkene. So you have ethane, which is C2H6. Okay. And then corresponding to ethane, you have ethene, 
Okay. So now this C2, so two carbon, they have a double bond between them. Okay. So this is called unsaturated fuel, okay, because you can add more hydrogen into this. Okay. So ethene and this nomenclature go the same way. If you have two double one double bond in heptane, then it will call heptene. Okay, so those are the alkenes or olefins. Okay, so here example of heptene. Okay. And then you can have so no double bond, one double bond, then you have one triple bond. So ethene or ethylene, and then you have acetylene. Okay, other name is ethyne. So here you can have propyne or butyne or heptyne. So the nomenclature is very consistent that okay. So here you have heptyne. So these are alkynes, so one triple bond. Okay. <coughs> then the other hydrocarbons, branch change alkenes, alkenes or alkenes. So in the middle is the example of iso octane, similarly you can have isobutane. And then there are cycloalkanes. So now it's, you know they are in a kind of a ring structure. So you have cyclopropane. To make this ring, you need at least three carbon, obviously. So three are higher. Cyclohexane and so on. Okay, the other kind is the aromatics. So Benzene is the simplest aromatic, so it has six carbons. Okay. And again, you can, once you understand the basic idea that you know, if you have two double bond, then you need two single bond or another double bond. Okay. So that way you can understand. Then toluene, okay. toluene you can see basically you, know, you take that hydrogen, you remove this hydrogen from the top, that I have this, and you replace that by CH3. So that's toluene. And then you can you have the larger aromatics. So this is two rings. Then you can have three rings, four rings. Those are very important, you know, for the soot formation. The larger ring structures. Then I, I mentioned here biofuels like ethanol, butanol. Okay. So now you can easily write the chemical, you know, write the chemical structure, okay. So ethanol, so ethane is C2H6. So once you know how to write the chemical structure of that, okay, you replace one H by OH. Okay. So that way you can write for butanol even, you know, higher ones, decanol for example. These, you know, are used either as some of the fuels, like esters, okay. And these are also the intermediate uh, dimethyl ether. Ethers are used as fuel because those are like okay, oxygenated fuels. And some of these are produced during the combustion of other fuels. Okay. So there are a lot more details here, so I'll skip this. But you have it for your reference in the PDF, you know, files. Then uh, this is part of this slide only. Yeah, this is part of the slide. <coughs> and then biodiesel components. So when you make biodiesel from vegetable or other sources, okay, it contains you know several different uh, uh, components. So here I mentioned you know a couple of them. Uh, how do you write the chemical structure of these? So there is a there is a hydrocarbon part. Uh, this is the hydrocarbon part, and this is the other part. So you combine those two. Okay. So here you have butanote. Same way you can make heptanote or decanote. Okay. For butanote, you have one, two, three. And you can say this is the fourth carbon for the butanote. If you make a decanote, it will have instead of four carbons, on the left it will have 
instead of 4, it will have 10. Okay? So you can build the other chemical structures of you know, the larger biodiesels. In biodiesels also, they can have a saturated biodiesel or it can have unsaturated, so that means it has you know, double bond. Okay. And once you have a double bond, one double bond or two double bonds, then the chemical reactions, the dominant chemical reactions, okay, and the combustion process is com strongly modified. You know, for example, the ignition behavior is strongly modified, whether it's a saturated fuel or a unsaturated fuel. Okay, so that was a overview of the various fuels. So that's the main topic, one main topic we covered. Okay, now I'll start with the basic, you know, classical thermodynamics or, or thermochemistry. So that's the main topic for the next three, four lectures. So to start with the review of classical thermodynamics, okay. So they are kind of, you know, together thermochemistry and classical thermodynamics. When you teach thermodynamics or you study thermodynamics, okay, you rarely talk about you know the the equilibrium composition. I think you talk probably about the temperature, okay adiabatic equilibrium temperature, but maybe not, don't use the second law of thermodynamics or entropy to study the composition, okay. <laughs> so that's the part of the thermochemistry, okay. So we start with the very basic language of thermodynamics or chemical reactions, you know, and then build on that, so the main, the main two topics will be the adiabatic flame temperature and then the composition of a reactive mixture. So those are the two main topics, okay, from all of this. Okay. So this is just so that, you know, you can get used to, you know, the language of, you know, thermodynamics and combustion and flames. Okay, so we use the ideal gas equation a lot. So these are the various forms. So the basic form here Okay. This one is used a lot. Okay. And the other one uh, is over here. Okay. PV pressure times the volume. Okay. This is the number of moles. So either you use moles or you use the mass, which is in terms of density. So here I think we have to need to remember. So either you use your mass per unit volume or we use the number of moles per unit volume. So density, the, uh, the similar thing will be concentration. Okay. So C here is the moles per unit volume. Okay. Now the basic okay, element of course, <coughs> gas is molecules, right? Whether atoms or molecules. So generically we say molecules. But molecules will be very the molecular properties like molecules, the mass of each molecule, okay, will be very inconvenient to use in analysis, okay, because molecules are like 10 to the power 25, 26, okay. So when you do math, it will be very difficult to keep track of all these, you know, large or very small numbers. So either the numbers are very large or very small. So to avoid that, we use moles, okay. So how they are related? So the number of moles and molecules, they are related through the Avogadro's number. So basically that one molecule contains this many, uh, one mole contains these many molecules. Okay. And then to use this, there are some limitations in terms of the properties of the mixture. Okay. So the classical or the ideal gas law is applicable when the pressures are relatively low and temperatures are high. If you go to very high pressure, exceeding the critical <coughs> pressures, then you know you cannot use this law. 
So what is the basic assumption you know, using this ideal gas? Okay. There are two basic assumptions. They are related. Okay. One is no intermolecular forces. Okay. These molecules are freely moving. Okay. Their motion is not influenced by the other molecules except when they collide. Then we can build this ideal gas law and also some you know, transport properties, chemi you know, chemical reactions are based on that you know, model. The related property or the feature is that since all the molecules are freely moving, that means the whole volume is available for their motion. Okay. That means the molecules do not take any volume. So the volume actually occupied by the molecules is negligible compared to the total volume. So if now for diesel engine or other applications, okay, this low pressure assumption may not be valid. Then there are other you know, equations which are available these days. Okay, so we can use a modified equation of state. I think I can skip a lot of this. This is very basic stuff. What are the various properties? The more important properties we'll be using in the discussion, okay, like enthalpy, uh, internal energy, everything. So I'll skip here. Uh, main thing here is you can define the properties, which are the intensive properties, which depend upon the amount of the mass. So you can define those properties either per mole or per unit mass. Okay. So we'll use, you know, in this, you know, this equilibrium uh, properties, we'll use both, you know, per unit mass as well as per unit uh, mole. Okay. okay, now the any thermodynamic system, okay, you can define the system by classical thermodynamic system by two properties. So you can pick any two properties. Okay. For example, you can pick temperature and volume. Either you can take the total volume, here is volume okay, per unit mass. Okay. So here you can put temperature and volume or temperature and density or you can put temperature, take temperature and pressure, or you can take some other two properties. Right. So once you define two properties, then you can write the other prop thermodynamic properties or the state of the system okay, by those two properties. Okay. So for example, we'll use internal energy as a function of temperature and specific volume. Okay. And now uh, internal energy is a actual thermodynamic property for the mixture, okay, or for any gas. Okay. Whereas enthalpy is a, you can say it's a mathematical property. It's used for analysis, okay, and it's defined by the other thermodynamic properties. So enthalpy is U plus H times P times specific volume. So if you take the total enthalpy, it will be total internal energy. No, P doesn't change. P is a okay, property. It does not depend on the amount of mass or number of moles. So it will become total enthalpy equal to total internal energy plus pressure times total volume. Okay. So now, if it is an ideal mixture, ideal gas, okay, then these two properties, internal energy and enthalpy, okay, they are only function of temperature. They are independent of pressure. Okay. Either pressure in case of enthalpy or here it will be ind independent of specific volume. So we make use of these two properties okay, to define some other properties later. Otherwise, you know, okay, if you have a reacting mixture, then you add another variable, the composition. So for pure gas, it's only two properties, any two properties you can take. But when you have a mixture, then you have to add, okay, either the number of moles of different species or the densities of different species. Okay. So density here is defined in terms of the mass fraction, 
I did not write here, but it can also be mole fraction. So that's, I think, in one of the next slides. But before that, so once you have, so I can write this part on the board. So you have H, which is a function of temperature only for ideal mixture. Then from here, you can define the specific heat at constant pressure, okay. which is dH dt. Now, of course, it's independent of pressure. Okay, so it does, you don't have to say at constant pressure. Normally, we say specific heat at constant pressure. Similarly, we can define CV as du dt. So from there, we define these two properties, which were on the next slide. So from here, you can also define dH as CPDT. So we'll use this a lot in the analysis. And then there are other properties there. Okay. You can define CP, CV, and then CP related to CV through the gas constant. Okay. And then the ratio of the specific heat is very important, the thermodynamic and combustion analysis. Okay. So then again, these are the definitions of this. So the main thing here is that the specific heats, Cp, Cv, they are very strong function of temperature. Okay. So in the analysis, we have to be very, very aware of this part. Okay. So this is a typical variation. A Cp as a function of temperature for some typical gases. Okay. So monatomic gas, it is almost constant. And then, then how it in, you know, increases the temperature for diatomic gases and then polyatomic gases. Okay. So what is the main takeaway? Okay. That the Cp is higher okay, as the molecule becomes more complex. Okay. The polyatomic molecules, the Cp values are much higher, and then they are stronger function of temperature. Okay. Initially, they rise very fast, and then, of course, they kind of level off. Okay. So to understand this behavior, okay, you have to understand you know, the various okay, modes where the energy can be stored in the molecule, okay, like translation, rotation, Okay, vibration and so on. So like here you have all three modes, translation. Now the temperature on the other hand is related to the translation energy. Okay, how fast the molecules are moving. Okay. Where the Cp value is related how the energy is stored in the different modes. Okay. So understanding these two things, you can understand you know, why the Cp value will change for different gases and why it will change with, with temperature. But the main takeaway is, OK, we have to be very aware of that. When you have CO2 in the mixture, the Cp value is much higher. Okay. Then how it affects the flame temperature, okay, the Cp values. To give you a simple example, you know, not related to thermodynamics, okay, the Cp value of water is very high. Okay. So that affects all of our rain and the atmosphere. Okay. Why, how it affects? If the Cp value was low, then all the lake and the ocean temperature will be higher okay, when it is hot outside. And a lot more water will evaporate, a lot more rain. Okay. So nature has already done that for us. Okay. That the water, the lake temperature doesn't change as much when the temperature is very high okay, because the Cp value is high. Okay. <coughs> 
So keep this kind of uh, figure in mind when we study flame temperature and other flame properties. Okay, now to defining for defining a mixture, okay, we had to be very okay. What should I say? Familiar with this, you know, this language, you know, the mass fraction. What is mass fraction? That's the mass of any individual species, okay, divided by the total mass. So you can define easier using mass fraction or mole fraction. Okay. Uh, here we can use a simple example like say air. Okay. So air, what is the mole fraction of oxygen? Yeah, about you know we use the value like twenty one percent. That's the mole fraction. So point two one. Okay. And then the nitrogen is 0.79. Okay. Then there are equations which you can convert mole fraction to mass fraction. So this is like one equation. Mole fraction is directly related. To the mass fraction <coughs> yi is you can get from the mole fraction. Okay. You just have to just use the number of moles and so on. So, for example, here. Going from here, so this is pretty obvious. Okay, when you add all the mole fractions, that has to be one, by definition. Same way, all sum all the mole fractions, that will be one. Like 0 0.21 and 0 0.79 has to be. That's how the 0 0.21 and 0 0.79 comes right for air. Yeah. Say it again, sorry. Uh, high, yeah. So, if the higher uh, heat is flowing out of the uh, surface of the earth, then it will be absorbing more heat and less temperature I can do. That is, yeah, for sure. Effect will be lesser compared to other heat. If you are carbon monoxide and other things. So, the high temperature is not at the temperature of the surface 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 of the surface. Yeah, the atmosphere, the ambient temperature, the atmosphere temperature doesn't change as much. Okay. That is the answer for you know what you are asking. But you are in principle, you are right. In principle, you are right. Okay. That if your heat is given the temperature, but the the difference would be very small because the temperatures are not that high. Okay. Now, other way to understand this, okay, you know, when you say react, you know, if you have methane, it produces CO2, okay. But if you artificially add some CO2 to the system, then you can lower the temperature, okay, because when you are adding CO2, you are increasing the CP value of the mixture. Okay, because the CP value of the mixture depends on the CP value of all the constituents, right? Constituents. So, so if you have more CO2 or more water, okay, so you are increasing the CP of the mixture and you can lower the temperature. Okay. So that's one way to lower emissions also because the emissions depend on the how high the temperature is. Okay. So coming back to this, so then you can also define the molecular weight of the mixture. Simplest <coughs> way is this way, because what is the molecular weight <coughs> of the mixture? So you know, here you have, okay, number of different uh, components. So you take the number of moles of each, so I is the species, so moles of each species times the molecular weight of each species. So that gives the mass for each species, right? And then you define, divide by the total number of moles. So that gives the molecular weight, it comes out as mole fraction. So right away we are using mole fraction property to define the molecular weight of the mixture. Okay. And then you can calculate one from the other. 
if you know x i you can calculate y i or vice versa. Okay. So, <coughs> other use will be okay, you can define the partial pressure okay, individual species, partial pressure of species i. So, we will be using this equation. So, this is like the equation of state for each species. Okay. And most common way to use this mass fraction, mole fraction, okay. For example, the CP value of the mixture. Okay, that's what we are we are just talking about a minute ago. The CP of the mixture is either mass fraction of each species times CPI, CP of the each species. So you sum this, or you can sum over the mole fraction. Okay. So here we are defining CP per unit mass then C P with a bar that's per unit more. Okay. So for the analysis for equilibrium properties, okay, we ne will need the C P I values for different gases. Okay. Now C P I as indicated here so, this is the normal way of calculating CP for combustion analysis or flame analysis. Okay. So, people have published you know the experimental values of CP as a function of temperature. So, knowing the experimental data, using the experimental data, they have done, they have done this you know curve fitting the polynomial fits okay, of, of the experimental data. So this is not this equation is very not scientific. This is based on the experimental data. They use they have developed these polynomials, typically these fourth fourth degree polynomials, which gives C P, C V as a function of temperature. So these are used quite extensively. Most of the softwares, you know, the combustion softwares, they use C P as a four degree polynomial. C P also also enthalpies as in terms of polynomials for function of temperature. Okay. So let me finish this. Okay, I think this is a good uh, slide to stop. So 10:30 you start again, right?